What do you prioritize more? People liking you or your life's purpose? If you knew you could have everything you wanted if you just believed, would you take the first step or wait another 10 years? Here on the SDRNR podcast, we tackle everything holding us back. It takes me fucking hours. Fucking hours. It costs that much because I don't have superpowers. You need to pay for my skills because exposure doesn't pay the bills. It costs that much because it takes me fucking hours. I know you think my prices are negotiable But if you keep on questioning I will not be so sociable And feel free to walk away Cause I know just what my art is worth So hear me when I say that It costs that much cause it took me years to master All right, guys, let's jump right in. Got an exciting episode. Certainly, uh, it was a game changer for me to realize these things. The feel of the song, the vibe, if you will, I think uh, hits really strongly with what we're talking about today, which is charging what you're worth and charging appropriate prices for the products or services that your business is offering to people. This also, of course, counts for you if you're a W-2 worker, if you're working nine to five or even part time or whatever it is for an employer and you don't own your own business. We're all sort of selling our products and services to somebody, you know, and maybe it's our boss or supervisors or whatever, but you know, we're, we're always selling in a way. So no matter what the context is, there's always the need to sell or influence people. And we need to charge an appropriate value for that. So determining the value of a product or service, especially your own, I think is a difficult thing to do because we've got all this negative self-talk about it. Maybe we've got, you know, self-doubt or maybe we're too cocky in a way. Like maybe we think we deserve more or we're owed more, right? You know, we might think that people should pay a lot more money for what it is than the market allows for. Okay, so I think there's a lot of factors that we need to account for, literally, (laughs) in our accounting of the prices that we should charge for things, okay? So I'm just gonna make an easy example because this makes sense for me, okay? So I'm gonna talk about legal services and the cost for that. When determining the cost of legal services, that's a professional service, right? Most people equate time to it. I think time is an element for sure, but that's not everything. There's this disconnect often that I find, and I certainly shared in this myself when I was first in this world, but people think about how much they make per hour, and then a lawyer will say, you know, well, I I charge 350 an hour or something. Most people make themselves, like take home money, far less than that amount. I think that would be in the top 1% of an hourly rate. But that 350 an hour, there's a lot of expenses tied to that. That's not what the lawyer makes. That's what the lawyer makes for the firm. When I was determining how to price flat fees for things, for example. First, I I went at it, and this was a mistake, so I would encourage you not to do this, but at first I said, well, I think it's worth this amount, I don't know, $1,000, right, for this product or service. But that's just an arbitrary number that I pulled out of nowhere, and it was attached to my feelings. And feelings aren't really defensible. If somebody challenges your prices, you don't want to have it based on, I just felt like that was a good price, right? Like, that's not really going to save you. What you need is is a reason to charge that amount. You need multiple reasons, really. So what I looked at, we called it a SKU chart, S-K-U, and this was a really exciting thing for me to do as a business owner, and I would highly encourage you to do it as well. We really need to know what our production costs are for a given product or service that we're offering. I found out that doing a trademark analysis, so across the USPTO database and searching all of the different entities like in the United States that have a similar trademark brand name to this one that we're analyzing, checking state databases, all of that work took my team and I about three to five hours per trademark 
to do. And then it would take another three to five hours for us to create the legal description of that brand name and services, you know, or products offered and submit an application with the USPTO. It took a total of six to 10 hours of work for us to do that. So what am I attorneys paid by the law firm per hour? What are my paralegals paid by the law firm per hour? What is the hourly costs of overhead? So you've got hard costs like the lease, the rent for the office. You've got like equipment costs, computers and printers and such for people to use. You've got benefits that you pay people. And when you stack all of this up, you come out with this number. So my hard costs, hard and soft costs, was something like, I think, $1,200 to do this amount of work. And, and I also included the way that I calculated the hard costs was I said X amount of production hours available with the firm per week or even per workday. So if we've got four attorneys or something and they're each able to produce, I don't know, six hours of billable work product that day, then that's 24 hours per business day. So you split up the hard costs among those production hours. So anyway, you need to make a number. Right. And what I realized at that time was that I was charging far too little for these trademark analyses and uh, application submissions that we were doing. I was charging, I think, around 850 for all of that. And that meant that I was actually losing money. So I felt that that was a good rate. <laughs> I felt that 850 was an appropriate rate, but it was obviously for me as a business owner, that product, that service was terribly underpriced. You want to calculate it so that you have some kind of a margin in there. You make a profit from doing this transaction unless you're just doing these as a big favor for your customers. And there are, there's loss leaders, I suppose, but steer clear of those unless you definitely have a good return on that investment, right? Some businesses will give you like the Groupon discount, the sale or whatever, the fire sale to get people in the door, knowing that they're gonna make up that lost money on a high margin product somewhere else. I used to work at Best Buy and sell printers. And I remember it was hilarious because we would sell a printer for like $90 and they were losing money on that for sure. These printers were amazing. But in order to use the printer, you had to have a printer cable and they would sell the cable separately. So the margin on the printer was like negative 10 or 20%. The margin on the cables was like 90% or something, right? Positive. I think the cables cost them like 50 cents each and they sold it for like $50. And I'm not suggesting that you necessarily do that, but that gets you an idea of some strategies. You have a product or service that gets people in the door and then you make up your margin elsewhere. So I took this knowledge and for every service that we did and, you know, people would try to cut down my costs, which is fine. We entrepreneurs, we think that way, <laughs> you know, we're like bargainers, right? Can you do it for 30% off? Cause you like me. I think I used to fall for that kind of shit because it was a touchy feely thing. It was a relationship thing, but I could then say, well, if you also like me and it sounds like you do, you would be very disrespectful if you would expect for me to invest my money into your company rather than you paying me appropriate money so that I at least break even and hopefully make 30% margin on that. So it becomes not a fight of who likes each other more and who's willing to like, I guess, self-sacrifice and all of this kind of bullshit, which is like a race to the bottom. And then you can actually stick to the value of your product or service. Knowing that cost is also very important for if you're selling physical products or even software, even digital products, because, you know, there are costs associated with that. And what's your business model? You know, is your business model to get a bunch of investors and get a bunch of users on that app platform for the first few years, knowing that you're going to go at like a, a run rate of losing some money or breaking even or something? Or is your model to, you know, always be cash positive and be in the black and be making money, you know, on every transaction? So you got to be thinking about these things. I guess this whole episode is to encourage you all to really think about your pricing in all of these different perspectives because we culturally, I believe, we, we look at the prices that we are paid for whatever it is we're doing and we attribute our own value to that number, 
okay? Which is sad. It's not about you. In all of sales, it's never about you. It's about the customer and the customer's need for that product or service and the value that they attribute to it. That's like sales 101. So you need to step out of that picture and you need to let go of the idea that your value to this universe is limited or determined by what you are paid for different things because that will really hold you back right if you expect the world to pay you what you believe you deserve that's probably not a winning battle for any sustained period of time not because people don't like you not because you don't deserve it not because you're a bad person not because you're worth less or something like that but simply because that's not thinking realistically about the customers and the value in the marketplace and all of these other perspectives on cost so another perspective i want to get into is the supply demand curve hopefully you've seen some of this in college or high school or if not just google it and i'm sure there's like a five minute youtube video that'll like blow your mind but i love to think about the market in terms of supply and demand so those are two extremely important fundamental factors in any marketplace when i first started the law firm in about 2013 there was a major abundance of what I would call baby lawyers. And I was one of them. So new lawyers in the marketplace, we sort of flooded the marketplace. What had happened was in 2008, the market crashed, you know, from the real estate stuff. And a lot of people went to law school during that time while the economy recovered. And there was like a 25 or 30% increase in normal law school enrollment across the board, which is crazy. So there was an overabundance of a lot of great attorneys in the marketplace. So we had an overabundance and increase of supply. And because of the market crash, a lot of people wanted legal services less than before. So they took the huge risk of hiring lawyers less and trying to do legal stuff on their own. I mean, we can get into that at another time. But so the demand went down and the supply went way up. And that created a really cool opportunity for me as a law firm owner because I could employ lawyers for less because I knew that the market allowed for it. No longer could lawyers demand huge salaries like 150000 a year especially if they were just getting into the market, if they were just out of law school. So there was low demand and high supply. So it was okay for me to say no to someone asking for a salary that I thought was too large, given the market. And it was fine for me to hire someone at a lower rate. And I myself was in that, right? When I worked a major law firm, they didn't pay me what they normally would because of that market. Now it's flipped. So now we have the labor shortage and most of my clients are suffering from this with the businesses that they own because good workers are hard to find. So the demand has gone way up after the pandemic and a lot of people decided to stay home and work at home. That created more demand because a lot of them just stayed there and that's okay. That's their decision. But that means that we have less supply in the marketplace, less workers and more demand for workers because all of these businesses want to hire people. So, you know, the unemployment rate has gone way down. You also need to think about the supply demand curve for your product. I love that we have a bunch of unique legal products and services to offer. One of them is the Phantom Stock Program. There's not a lot of law firms out there that can offer this, that understand this newer legal technology called Phantom Stock that gives a safe amount of equity to great employees. It's just great for everybody because the employee isn't taxed on that amount of equity that they're given because it's not traditional stock and the employer is safe from that because if they have a falling out and they quit for whatever reason, they don't have to continue to pay them profits off the top of the company's income forever. As long as the company's out, they only have to pay them as long as they're there. So that's a legal service that's specific to us. So there's a decent amount of demand for that, but there's not a lot of supply. So that's a great product that we have. As a, another example, there's a lot of law firms out there that will do what's called the registered agent services. So when you need to register your company with the Secretary of State, you need to assign a lawyer to be your registered agent. It's not typically a lot of work, so that's very commoditized. I really want you to factor in your customer's value of whatever product or service it is that you're offering. 
and step aside. So take your piece out of it. You know, I know you're a beautiful and unique snowflake, but the customer doesn't really care so much as you have the ability to give them what they need, you know, the product they want. From a sales standard, from a sales perspective, you need to learn and understand what your customers are looking for precisely. And if that's something that you can give them, or if not, it's something that you can find someone you know that can. So ask them questions. Be quiet yourself. In the world of advertising, we've come so far from the original advertisements that was like, you know, our product is 10% more efficient than these others and the price is 15% less. So buy our stuff. You know, I'm thinking these 1950s like TV ads. Nobody cares about that kind of thing. That doesn't do it for us anymore. Now it's a vibe. So advertising and marketing now is more focused on the customer, you know, and hey, these are our types of people. So if you like this music and you hang out with these people and you have these values or whatever, you're probably a good customer for us and we would be a good brand for you to associate yourself with, right? So that's a very different angle. What are your customers' needs? If they're calling you, if they're looking at your product or service, there's a reason why they're looking at it. And it might not be that they want exactly what you have to offer, but it's worth it to you to ask. You will never be able to sell something unless the customer perceives more value to that thing than what you are charging for it. A successful sale has both parties profiting from the transaction. Okay, so let me be very clear about this. But a sale does not happen until both people perceive profit from it, okay? So the legal services that I can render to my clients is of more value to them than what they are paying me. So if the value to their firm is $30,000, they're interested in an employment contract for a high C-level supervisor or something, and the company is in danger of the supervisor stealing their customer lists and working for a competitor or becoming a competitor themselves. So if that happened, their company could lose 40% of its income. 40% of its customers would go to this competitor. What's the annual income that that company makes? Well, it's a million dollars. So 40% of that is $400,000. So that means that the value of this contract that prevents this employee from stealing 40% of the business is uh, $400,000. And I'm not saying I'm gonna charge $400,000. I would probably charge like $3,000 or something like that. Also, the value to me is I gotta set my prices appropriately as well, right? Because if I have to pay my team $2,000 to do this work, then I have to charge at least $2,001 for that to make any sense. I'm profiting from it for everything over 2001 that they pay for it, right? They're profiting for it for everything under 400,000. So obviously we can meet somewhere in the middle and they would probably prefer that it be lower and I would prefer that it be higher and we can figure that out. But a sale doesn't happen unless they understand the value of what they are being sold they might not be thinking that it's actually worth 400,000 to them. They're gonna have this idea, this feeling in their minds that this should cost 500 bucks. I felt like it should cost this. And then you can back it up and you can say, well, for me, my hard costs to pay my staff to do this and to keep the lights on and all of that is 2,000, right? So let's start there. You need to walk them through that. You need to educate your customer base so that they understand the value of your product. And that can be hard because it takes a lot of attention to understand what they're looking at. So we've talked a lot about the supply demand curve and those factors on the market. We've talked a lot about the value that your customers perceive. We've talked about your actual costs for a product or service. And we've talked about sort of throwing out the feeling that you have associated with that. Get past your own feelings because that's not really going to help you much. Get past identifying with what you charge. That's not you. We as business owners will say, I'm doing bad today. <laughs> Even though we're not doing bad, but our business is doing bad, 
my business is struggling as if we are the business itself, but you're not. You are independent of your business. I understand that you have put a lot of your own sweat and blood and tears into that business, but you are not the business. It's okay and important even to not identify yourself as the business, okay? You are a business owner, so you own a separate independent business, okay? <laughs> I also think that we can sabotage ourselves because of our given financial set points. When I first was talking to this mentor group, they asked me, what would you like to make in a year? I said at the time, having not gone through a lot of self-development and mindset work, I said, well, I don't need much. <laughs> And they said, well, I didn't ask what you need, and I understand that you don't need much, but I asked, what do you want to make? You know, what do you want? And I said, well, I'm not greedy. <laughs> so if you can analyze this, these statements, I was not answering the question. I was triggered by the questions, and I was answering a very different question as if the guy was accusing me of being greedy. So I couldn't even get past that self sabotaging sort of speed bump and see that he was just asking what I wanted. It was a very simple question. And it's okay and important to state what you want. Go back to our first episode that we did with the temptations. What do you want? If you don't know what you want, you're definitely not going to get it. After, you know, a few minutes of this conversation and the absurdity therein, he got me to say I would like around 220000 a year. I think if I made that amount, I would be jumping for joy and that would be enough. He was like, well, most of our members want more than that because when you look at the costs of daycare, for example, or private schools or nice luxury vehicles and homes and things like this, savings, that lifestyle requires more money. But I was really pushing back, okay? So I was self-sabotaging. I was saying, I don't want to hear your solutions for me to make more money than this. This is my top imaginable financial success point. That was the most money that I could possibly imagine myself making. And I think at the time I was making around 170 or something, 150. Do you see that? So I was self-sabotaging. I was refusing the truth. I was refusing to listen to this guy's advice or perspective. I was rejecting him completely out of fear of my own success. When people say charge what you're worth, it's very hard to determine what you're worth because that's subjective to the customer buying the products or services that you offer. So to just cap all of that, you can sabotage yourself and your own success by charging too much or too little. Those are both easy ways to self-sabotage. Look at the market, don't look at yourself. Don't look at how you feel, look at what it actually costs. What's the actual value to a customer? What's the customer willing to pay? And what is the actual cost for you? And what are you willing to work for? And don't get stuck in the like, I gotta keep the lights on because that is a losing strategy. If you take orders for stuff that you are losing money on, even in the long run, you know, uh, much less the short, that's not worth it to you. You will run your company into the ground. It's a race to the bottom. Okay, so watch out for that. Your subconscious will sabotage you in these weird ways. And, and that really shouldn't affect the way that you price things. I often find in myself and with a lot of business owner clients that once you get around like a success range, if you get enough orders to where you're taking home whatever amount of money, they will slow it down. They'll like pull back on marketing. Why? Because they're doing okay and they don't want to do better, which is strange to me. If you think about it, if you look at it objectively, you would say, well, keep the marketing going, keep the sales going, keep just hire more producers to, to do that work or create those products. But instead of doing that, they, they tend to sort of slow down the growth because they're uncomfortable with that success in the same way that if they're not having the success that they want, if they're going down, they start to market like crazy and do better sales and, you know, get money in the door, right? To get to that financial set point line, which is sort of where they cruise. So just be aware of that and make sure that you're charging appropriate amounts, you know? On a flash sale and in the bargain bin, if someone's going bankrupt out of business, the same exact thing will cost far less. You attribute this value to it arbitrarily. And it's, it goes the same for your business and your products and services. When I was first starting, I was trying to save my clients a lot of money. So I would always charge less than the market. 
and there was a lot of clients that had to like scratch their heads and double check that I wasn't a shitty lawyer. They had to say, well, are you good? Because you're charging 20% less than the market, 30% less than I would be willing to pay. So they're questioning my value, not because I wasn't able to do this, but because they attribute my value, the value of my services to the prices that I charge. So be wary of that. Sometimes, and it might feel a little funky, but you might need to like triple your rates for things. You know, if you're the only one offering that specific uh, product and there's a lot of demand for it, charge more. You say, I'm not worth that, or, you know, I'm not special, or <laughs> I'm not greedy, right? But that's all in your head, so get beside that. There was this true story going around a couple years ago where this violinist that played in the New York subway, and he played for like four hours straight, and he made something like $20 in you know, tips, and there was only three people that stayed longer than five minutes to listen to his music. That same night, he went and played for the New York Philharmonic Orchestra or Symphony or whatever. He was the most talented violinist in the world, and they charged over $100 for every seat, and some seats were like $800, and the place was sold out that night. You know, that place took home in the realm of $75,000 for that one performance, and he was the star of the show. So between $20 and $75,000, I mean, just think about that because you're doing that yourself. People attribute value based on what you charge. Obviously, had he advertised and said, hey, the greatest violinist in the world is going to be playing a show in the New York subway between these hours for four hours long, anybody can attend. If they knew that he was the greatest in the world, then they would pay that. But it was the same exact violinist playing the same part, literally. There's another story. So there was this huge boat that had an engine that was like not running appropriately. And this team of investors had purchased this boat. I think this happened in like the 30s. The boat wouldn't work, so this engine was seized, and nobody could figure it out, so they hired a bunch of people to look at it, and this older guy came to them and, and said, I can fix your boat, and they're like, okay, what will it cost? And he said $3,000, which back in those days, probably like 50000 now. So he went up to it, he looked at it, he listened to it, he examined it, and then he took his hammer, and he hit the hammer in one spot on one bolt, and immediately the engine started working again. And then he went to them and, you know, they said, well, you just did this, you know? And he's like, well, yeah, but I fixed the boat. I fixed the engine. And they said, well, we need an itemized invoice because we don't want to pay you $3,000 for you hitting a hammer somewhere. And he said, okay. So he said, hammer, you know, $2, $2,998, knowing where to hit it. <laughs> Right? So that's the professional in there. I had a client that had a very specific legal need that I couldn't fulfill. This was specific to California regulations, which are nuts. And this lawyer, he only did this work. He didn't do anything else, but he charged, I think, 1200 bucks an hour. And he could fix that problem within about four hours of work. It would have taken me, even though I was charging 350 at the time or something, it would have taken me like gosh, probably 150 hours to figure out how to fix that problem. So if you look at it that way, his charging 1200 bucks an hour makes a lot of sense. All right, that's all the time we got for today. I'm Jonathan Sparks. I'm a business lawyer, mindset coach, business coach. I have been hired for some speaking events. If you want to talk to us about anything like that, feel free to give us a call. It's 470-268-5234. You can also find my music on jonathansparksmusic.com and the law firm is sparkslawpractice.com. Keep rocking and rolling, guys. We'll see you next week. If you enjoyed this podcast and you want to hear more, check us out on jonathansparksmusic.com, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, sparksmusic.com. Please like and subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a friend. We love you guys. We'll talk soon.